for the heart doctors, um, do you recommend stents, bypass surgery, um, statins? Um, and at what point do you stop talking about lifestyle and just say you need to take do you know emergency medicine? Like what what point does uh, do you recommend those procedures or other ones? And at what point is it too late to be talking to someone about that and they need a greater intervention? And then separately, I have a question for Dr. Campbell, which is in your most recent book, you spent a large, large number of pages talking about how the nutrition industry has, um, has found a link between nutrition and cancer prevention, and that this information was suppressed by the industry. Or um, that, in other words, that for the, if this isn't brand new 2022 information that you can affect your cancer rates with diet. You're saying 100 years ago, there was a Dr. Hoffman and this was all being studied and, and, and demonstrated. And yet, um, for reasons that um, were not in the best interest of the public, this was never, uh, this was not. Uh, made public and that the, the general public never learned how beneficial diet could be on cancer. So if we could talk, if the heart doctors to speak about that, and then if Dr. Campbell, you could comment on that point that I just made. I actually put stents in people. I'll, I'll field this one. Um, I think that there definitely is a role for, for coronary interventions for bypass surgery or for angioplasty, which is, um, an invasive approach to um, opening blocked arteries that doesn't involve cutting the chest wall open. Um, I, I think that it depends on the, the clinical scenario. If somebody is having a life-threatening event, if somebody is having a heart attack acutely or an unstable angina event, we know that coronary invasive procedures save lives. There, there's no question about that. I think the gray area comes in situations where there is somebody who has what we call stable angina, in that they have exertional symptoms um, due to a severe narrowing of an artery. And we've got good data that shows that um, we can actually treat those people medically and they don't necessarily need to have invasive procedures. However, where the area gets more complicated is if we look at the anatomy of the arteries of the heart, if we see something like a left main coronary artery lesion, or we see three vessel coronary disease, or we see a, a weakened heart muscle and severe coronary disease, those are situations where yes, a coronary intervention can save a life. And I think it's an important distinction to, um, to clarify to our patients. So I, I would love to weigh in on this as well, um, just because we've had such a, a shift in our guidelines, again, evidence-based. Uh, it was the ischemia trial, which was a follow-up to the uh, COURAGE trial that, that Bill Bowden ran. And it, it really challenged what cardiology has been doing for so many years. That is, they call it the oculostenotic reflex. You do an angiogram, you see a narrowing, you put a stent in it. And the fact of the matter is if it wasn't left main or the top portion of the artery going down the front, the left anterior descending, so-called proximal LAD, the one with the terrible nickname, misogynist, uh, so I shouldn't say it out loud, Widowmaker, because uh, everybody's heard it already. If it wasn't left main or proximal left anterior descending, there actually was no improvement in outcome. This was very upsetting to all of the interventional community when it came out um, in uh, 2019 at the American Heart Meeting, and then it was published the next March and got swallowed up by a pandemic, but it did reach the guidelines. And, the, and after reviewing everything, uh, all the literature is, if you're, like Dr. Shankman said, if you're having an acute uh, event, that's different. But for stable heart disease, um, you should not be having any stents put in uh, anywhere outside or any attempted at that putting more blood flow anywhere else. You should be doing uh, guideline medical therapy. And in, of course, in our view, everyone on here would add plant-based diets, to, to, which makes the medical therapy even more, pow more powerful. And so it, it really is a game changer. Um, it's another one of those times where you have to walk in the room and say, tell a patient what we, what we were doing for 40 years was wrong. 
Um, but you know, we we have to go with the new the new evidence, and that is we should not be doing as many stents uh, and bypasses. But if it's the left main, we still should do do that. And there's some room for the left anterior descending if it's high up. I I, I think that's excellent. I was going to comment on that, but you absolutely have. Uh... You were, maybe you were at the meeting that was in Philadelphia in November of 2019. Mm -hmm. But if you look at, there yeah. is some morbidity and mortality with these procedures. We know, for example, and it's, let's just talk about the stents. If you do the stents on, let's say, uh, 1,200,000 uh, 1, people having a stent, 1% will die. That's 12,000 people who will die getting a stent. 4% getting the stents will have a heart attack. That's 48,000 having a heart attack. Now, if we talk about bypass surgery, uh, we do fewer, 500,000, uh, but the um, uh, mortality is a little bit higher. It's not 1%, it's 3%. So there's 15,000 die annually getting <clears throat> bypass surgery. Another 3,000 will get a stroke uh, who have bypass surgery. So if we add the 15,000 deaths from stents, and the 12,000 deaths from bypass, that's 20, 27,000 who will die now per year. So if you take that over a decade, that's 270,000 people. That's over a quarter of a million people who will die simply getting these procedures who couldn't uh, tolerate it. So there are some reservations. I wanted to also just comment, <clears throat> and it's in our in our book, but I'm we're kind of a I'm kind of fascinated by the PET scan. This is a PET rubidium dipridimal scan. And we did it on a small group of patients. We took their PET scan at baseline. And you can see that most of the heart muscle was lovely, this lovely orange or yellow. But then there was always a little patch on the side that was green, that was poor perfusion. We counseled them at that time. And then three weeks later, we repeated the PET scan. It's reperfused. We haven't washed out any blockage or plaque in just three weeks. Why is that reperfused? And so I, I got a, a fascinating slide of a heart where all the muscle is removed and it's just all these gorgeous blood vessels and all three of those main vessels dive eventually into the heart muscle. They become intramuscularly. At that point, uh, I asked our cardiovascular pathologist uh, who dissects 200 hearts a year from the deceased. How often do you ever see any blockage or plaque once the artery has dived into the heart muscle? His answer, never. So now I had the answer. Why is it that suddenly within four, six, eight or 10 days, so many often the patients with angina will see their angina disappearing? Not, no, we haven't washed out their, their plaque and their major artery. Why are they getting better? Because what happens is when we first see these patients, their endothelial cells are so beaten down, they're hardly making any of this wonderful nitric oxide, the strongest the vessel dilator in the body, but more importantly, or equally important, they now are also manufacturing vasoconstrictors. The endothelial cells are making endothelin and thromboxane, which if you look at this slide I have, all those lovely tiny little vessels that are joined are all cramped and pinched not because they've got a blockage, but simply because they're sort of in the vessel is in some way of a spasm. So very rapidly, all that entire acreage of cascading, interconnecting intramuscular vessels suddenly opens. Then they get, as you recall, physics, Poisset's law of flow through the hollow viscous is related to the fourth power of the radius translation, a tiny increase in diameter, a huge increase in flow.